The last time when we were talking about the book of Acts, we didn't quite exactly finish chapter 15, although we hit the major important point. And so this morning what I would like to do is something a little ambitious, uh, try to get through the end of chapter 16 and discussing the gospel at Philippi. That is where we will be this morning. Of course, this is part of a larger section about how the gospel was in general brought to Macedonia and Achaia, the areas that we know as modern-day Greece. And uh, to wrap up a little bit from what we talked about last time in chapter 15, Acts chapter 15 was dominated by the Jerusalem meeting that took place. What happened was while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch, and they had been preaching for some time about the gospel and how you could be saved through Jesus Christ, uh, some Judaizing teachers, some men who were formerly Jews that had become Christians, started coming from Jerusalem to Antioch. And they were teaching a doctrine that said that you had to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. In other words, they believed you had to be circumcised and abide by the law of Moses before you could uh, be immersed into Christ. Well, of course, what this was false, and Paul and Barnabas disputed with them quite extensively, and then they went to Jerusalem just to find out where in the world this was coming from, at which point they all sat down, the apostles and the elders, and they uh, discussed it. And the point of the Jerusalem meeting, as I stressed last time, was not to determine what was true. It was not to make some great doctrinal decision to impose on the rest of the church, but rather to, of course, settle the issue, since Jerusalem was where this teaching was coming from in the first place. And the result of this meeting is, after discussing it at length, they, of course, they're all on the same page. The Holy Spirit had revealed that it was not necessary to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. That had already been proven in Acts chapter 10, whenever the Holy Spirit was poured out on the household of Cornelius. That was also already inherent in the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, James quotes from Amos chapter 9, which said that God would rebuild the tabernacle of David, restore its ruins so that the rest of mankind might seek the Lord. And so what happened is a letter was sent out to, uh, to defuse the situation. I realized I put the wrong word up there, diffuse instead of defuse. I apologize for that. That's what happens when you type too fast. Uh, a letter was sent out to defuse the situation caused by teachers coming from the Jerusalem church, the apostles and elders, they send out a letter to Antioch and other places via Paul and Barnabas. And I'll just begin reading in verse 22. It seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we have gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. If you, do, if you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. And what's going on is they send out the letter via Paul and Barnabas, and they also have some representatives from Jerusalem there, so that nobody will accuse Paul and Barnabas of just making stuff up. And so they have a long list of the senders and addressees. We've heard some of our congregation have been disturbing you. We don't condone them. We have nothing to do with them, it says in verse 24. We're sending some of our own men to repudiate this, along with Barnabas and Paul. These men have risked their lives for the gospel. And, of course, one of these men, Silas, becomes Paul's traveling companion, as we'll see in a moment. But the point of this is that the same gospel is being taught by Paul that's being taught in Jerusalem. They're not different from each other. And, of course, the gospel doesn't come from a authority inherent in Jerusalem. It comes from God directly. The decision ultimately comes from the Holy Spirit. Note that the Gentiles will not be required to keep the law of Moses. They will not be required to undergo the covenant of circumcision. Instead, they must hold to simply a few essentials, namely that they abstain from uh, 
things sacrificed to idols, in other words, participation in idolatry, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from such things, you will do well. These are the essentials, and they're still essential today. We don't practice idolatry, we don't engage in fornication, and we don't eat blood. Now, what goes on here in verses 30 through 35, they arrived with the letter, they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. After they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. And there's a variant in verse 34 that also mentions that Silas remained there. Um, so what happens is they all go to Antioch, they deliver the letter, the congregation rejoices, because the conflict from the beginning of chapter 15 has been solved. And there, there's a little bit more team preaching from the Jerusalem prophets. Judas and Silas, since they're prophets themselves, they encourage the brethren with a lengthy message. We don't know how lengthy it was. We know that it was apparently okay for Paul to preach till midnight elsewhere in Acts 20. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to do that this morning. But after spending some time there, the brethren send them away in peace. And Barnabas and Paul continue to stay in Antioch, preaching and teaching with many others also the word of the Lord. I want to again stress how important it is. These early churches seem to think it was important to have a plurality of people teaching. Teaching was not a one-man show in the New Testament. It was something done by many different people within the congregation. Now, of course, uh, Paul and Barnabas part ways. This is this the next thing we read about in verses 36 through 41? After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord, and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him al along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with them and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. He was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And what's happened here is, you know, if you'll remember that first journey that they took in chapters 13 and 14, where they traveled to Cyprus and to Galatia, and they started those different churches... Uh, now they're going to check up on them and just see how they're doing. And what follows is what we sometimes refer to as the second missionary journey, which was originally intended to be a checkup on churches they had started, but for Paul turns into a trip to Macedonia, a new territory. Well, there's a little disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas wants to take along John Mark. Uh, since they were act we learn in Colossians 4.10 that they were actually cousins, so maybe there's a little bit of you know, wanting to uh, show, give family a second chance here. But Paul doesn't want to bring John Mark because John Mark has proven himself to not be uh, consistent. He has deserted us. Halfway through the first journey, if you remember, John Mark left them in Pamphylia. We don't know why he left them, but Paul seems to think that this is a reason why they shouldn't bring him along. If he can't go the distance, we don't want him coming. The disagreement gets pretty heated. And eventually, Paul and Barnabas wind up taking two separate trips. Uh, Barnabas and Mark will go to Cyprus, since Barnabas is actually from Cyprus and he knows the area better. And Mark was actually there for that part last time, too. Paul and Silas will go to Galatia instead. So they split ways, and uh, of course their journey will take them farther than that. Uh, I can't help but think there's a certain irony in the fact that two apostles part ways after a call for a unified gospel people... Uh, it's perhaps it was sad. We don't. This is the last time we see Paul and Barnabas together in the book of Acts. Uh, he seldom, Barnabas is seldom mentioned in Paul's letters outside of, 1 outside of Galatians and 1 Corinthians 9.6. Um, there is one thing I want to note, though. You know, Paul doesn't really think much of John Mark at this point. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, uh, Paul, at the end of his life, writes that John Mark is useful to me for service. Which suggests that there's a happier ending to this story than what we see in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul's relationship with Mark eventually improves. 
And, you know, of course you can ask, well, did Mark mature and grow up? Did Paul mature and grow up? I don't know the answer to that. The point is that Christians don't have to be forever alienated by each other's shortcomings. I think that that's the real lesson we get out of this, is that, uh, you know, we don't have to stay. Well, there is no relationship in Christ that is so broken or so incapable of being fixed that the love of Christ cannot repair it. That is, of course, the goal of all of this. Our goal should be to make better relationships with our brethren so that our love for one another will not be in vain. The narrative does not follow Mark and Barnabas. Instead, no, we follow Paul and Silas and how they strengthen the churches in Syria and Cilicia. And what happens, of course, is they return to Galatia. And in verses 1 through 5, Paul came to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with them. He took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. While they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Even though Paul didn't take John, young John Mark as a helper, he finds a new helper in Timothy. Uh, Timothy, of course, is the same Timothy that we know the letters of 1st and 2nd Timothy to be written to. He's well spoken of by the brethren in Lystra and Iconium. Uh, Paul later writes about the faith that was in Timothy as a result of his mother's Lois and his grandmother Eunice's instruction in 2nd Timothy 1 and verse 5. These women were the ones who first taught Timothy the scriptures. And while Timothy's mother was Jewish and his grandmother was Jewish, his father was not Jewish. His father was Greek. And as a result of that, of course, Timothy is uncircumcised and not a Jew. So what does Paul do? Well, he circumcises Timothy to take him along. And we might think for a minute, well, wait a second. They just got done having this whole argument about circumcision in chapter 15 and why you don't have to do it. And here we go. Paul, is Paul flip-flopping on this issue? Is he taking a completely different approach now? Does he no longer believe the decree of Acts 15? Well, no. Paul himself continues to maintain in his letters after this point that circumcision and uncircumcision are nothing. Previously in Galatians, he had refused to have Titus circumcised in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 3. But Timothy has a disadvantage here. Everybody knows who Timothy is. Everybody knows that his father is a Greek. And if Paul is going to be taking Timothy along on his preaching trips, and if Paul is going to bring, be bringing Timothy into the synagogues, Timothy has to pass the scrutiny. And so what this is, is not an example of the belief that circumcision is necessary, but rather an example of becoming all things to all men. Paul wants to make Timothy more Jewish so that he can go and actually preach to these Jewish audiences. It's not a requirement for salvation, but it is a, ne a thing that will make the gospel easier to proclaim. And that's the difference between what is a requirement for us in terms of God and what we do uh, as our own personal decisions in order to help the cause of the gospel, in order to appeal to men. Uh, so th th there is a fundamental difference between those things. And if we are of the mindset that says, well, I'm not going to change for anybody. The Lord doesn't require me to do this, so I'm not going to change. I'm, you know, Everybody has to cater to my pet peeves. Well, that, that's not exactly the right way to go about it. How helpful is that to the gospel? How conducive is that to the gospel? Of course, we cannot compromise the gospel, and we cannot compromise our principles before God. But if such a thing is truly unnecessary one way or another and the gospel is helped one way over the other, then we should go with the route that is most effective towards the spreading of the gospel. That's what Paul did. He became, to the Jews, he became a Jew. To the one not under the law, he became one not under the law, though having the law of Christ. Why did he become all things to all men? So that he could win all. That was his goal. That ought to be our goal as well, to win all for the gospel. That brings us to Macedonia. In verses 6 through 10, it says, They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. 
And after they came to Mysia, and they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them, passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go up into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You ever hear of the Macedonian call? That's what this passage is talking about. Uh, we have a song about that, you know, send the light. We've heard the Macedonian call today. It's an allusion to this particular passage. What's going on here is they're moving through Asia Minor. Asia Minor is what we would call modern day Turkey. And if I had been thinking, I would have put a map up here, but I wasn't thinking when I made this PowerPoint, so I apologize. You're just going to have to use your mind's eye this morning. Uh, what is going on is after they pass through some of these Galatian churches, uh, they pass through Phrygia, the next logical step is what? Well, they're moving in a westward direction, so they might as well continue moving in a westward direction. There's a province called Asia to the west, not to be confused with the continent of Asia. It's a small province. It contained various cities like Ephesus and Philadelphia and Laodicea, um, which the book of Revelation was later addressed to. And so one might think, well, it's time to go to these prominent cities like Ephesus and preach the gospel there. But the Holy Spirit says, no, it's not time to preach the gospel in Asia. Paul doesn't get to Ephesus until the end of chapter 18. And he doesn't really spend any substantial time there until chapter 19. The Holy Spirit forbids him from entering the province of Asia at this time. He has to come in through the back door later. God is the one determining Paul's itinerary, not Paul. Okay, well, if God doesn't want us to go to Asia in the west, maybe we should move northward towards Bithynia. And because that, that was a province that was above them. They divert towards Mysia, the northwest part of Asia Minor. Maybe they're supposed to go there. But no, that's not right either. Because it says they tried to go to Bithynia in verse 7, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. He prevented them from preaching in that region as well. So here we go. Why are we passing up on all these opportunities to preach? Why are we passing up on all these different quote-unquote mission fields Well, we don't find out the answer, and they don't find out the answer until they get to Troas. Troas was on the northwest part of Turkey, Asia Minor, and it was a port city. And while they're in Troas, Paul receives a dream or a vision in the night of a man asking him to come over to Macedonia and help. That's the answer. In verse 10, they recognize from this vision that God had called them to preach the gospel in Macedonia. And so having seen this vision, who goes over to Macedonia? It says in verse 10, we sought to go into Macedonia. And there's a little subtle shift there if you're paying attention. Because, you know, throughout this section it's they did this, they did that, they did this, they did that. And in verse 10 it says we. Why? Well, because this is the point in the story in verse 10 at which Luke himself joins Paul and Silas on the journey. The we section will cease whenever Paul and Silas are arrested in chapter 16 and verse 19 uh, and will not resume until much, much later, which suggests that Luke was ultimately left behind in Philippi. So they go over to Macedonia. Verse 11, it says, they, Putting out to sea we, uh, from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized... She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Here we have the conversion of Lydia. It's the first thing that happens when they get to Macedonia. They set out from Troas to Samothrace to Neapolis to Philippi. Uh, Samothrace was a small rocky island in the sea uh, about halfway between these two locations. Neapolis, which means literally new city, was a seaport for Philippi. It was merely 10 miles away from the city proper. And the trip takes two days. You know, later on, the reverse trip in chapter 20 and verse 6 will take five days, so they'll have less favorable winds uh, later on in the story. Philippi 
was the leading city in Macedonia. It was an extremely culturally conscious environment. It was the eventual place to which Paul sent the letter we know as Philippians. Philippi was named for Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. It was also the site of a famous battle between uh, the triumvirate Augustus, Brutus, and Cassius. And well, that's not really what the triumvirate was. I'm getting my history confused there. Anyhow, in some place, it, in some place, in some ways, Philippi was the birthplace of the Roman Empire because that was where Augustus triumphed over everybody else and became emperor. And uh, as a, of course, as a result, Philippi is a Roman colony, which made them self-governed exempt from taxes, that sounds kind of cool, and uh, various other legal perks. And as a result, of course, Philippi was very loyal to Rome. They were probably one of what we might call, in our terms, they were the most, one of the most patriotic cities in that area, in, which will become relevant in a moment. On the Sabbath, Paul goes to the riverside where some women had assembled for prayer. There were no synagogues in the city, apparently. One of the results of the Roman dominance of that area. And this is one of the first times we see where Paul doesn't have a synagogue to go to. What does he do? He goes to the place of prayer. And it's mostly women. There's a lack of Jewish men. Uh, Jewish custom uh, held the belief that a synagogue had to have at least ten men in order to function. And so uh, lack of men meant no synagogue. And the first convert there is a woman named Lydia. Uh, we don't know whether Lydia was a Jew or a Gentile. People have argued vehemently both ways, and I don't know which. Um, she is a seller of purple fabrics from Thyatira. She was not native to Macedonia. However, she was a God-fearer, a God-worshipper. And what she hears from Paul provokes her to action. and says that the Lord opened her heart, and she responded to the things spoken by Paul. Why did God want them to come to Macedonia? In part because there's this woman named Lydia there who's going to open her heart to receive the message. And she's going to kind of be the gateway to getting into everybody else and kind of proclaiming the gospel there as well. But there's a reminder here too. The fact that the Lord opened her heart. Who opens people's hearts? Do I open people's hearts? Do I change hearts? No. Do you change hearts? Not unless it's your own heart. The messenger, the proclaimer, the preacher does not change people's hearts. They only proclaim the message. We are, our only recourse is to proclaim the gospel to people, to uh, sow the seed, proverbially speaking. It is God who changes the hearts. It is God who works on the hearts of others. It, if someone's not willing to listen to our gospel, we cannot force them to change. That is their decision. Is there, the Lord will open their heart or he will harden their heart as he did with Pharaoh. They'll harden their own heart or they'll open their own heart as was the case with Pharaoh. But we cannot make them be accepting of the gospel. That's just something to remind ourselves of. That the work that the Lord plays in conversion is larger than I think some people give him credit for. In, of course, her open heart leads to her baptism. And it leads to the baptism of her family. And Baptism is clearly synonymous with the coal conversion process here. Uh, what we see here, it's directly tied to the openness of her heart. Her conversion is not a casual once a week thing. Rather, she provides, you know, she's not, well, I'm sort of a Christian. I'm not like one of those crazy Jesus freak type Christians. No, she opens her home to the proclaimers of the gospel. She gives them lodging. Jesus had instructed the disciples to stay in the home of someone in the town in Luke 9 and verse 4. And if no one showed them hospitality, then the whole city was in rejection of the gospel. But that's not the case here. Here, Lydia gives lodging to Paul and to Silas, and presumably to Luke and Timothy as well, since they are now at least four people in their preaching team. But, of course, that's not the end of the story in Philippi. There's more to that. In verse 16, it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave woman having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to her, The Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. This is what we call the exorcism of the Pythoness. Uh, the spirit of divination, literally the spirit of a python, um, Python was a uh, Greek mythological figure, a serpent creature that Apollo had to slay. <coughs> uh, 
But here in this instance, it gives her the power to tell fortunes. And clearly what this is, of course, is an example of demon possession. She has an unclean spirit in her that gives her supernatural powers. And some people are making a lot of money off that. But how do we solve this? Well, you look what she's doing, though. Is the message she's proclaiming false? These men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Is that true? That's a true statement, isn't it? That was what Paul and Silas were doing. So why does Paul get so upset about this? Why well, Everything she said was true. Why wouldn't she want it? Well, of course, Paul clearly gets annoyed at it and wants to put a stop to it. Uh, you know, apparently this is not a kind of free advertising that he wants for himself. It's damaging to credibility. If people proclaiming your mission are demon-possessed, that's not going to look good on your resume. So he tells the demon to be silent and to come out of her. You know, we, we get it. Demons know the truth. Demons believe and tremble, James 2.19 says. That doesn't make demons a good place to get the truth. Let's ask ourselves a question. Do the ends justify the means in evangelism? This story seems the answer is no. You know, we shouldn't circulate false information simply, you know, because, oh, well, it might bring them to the truth. No, bad idea. And we shouldn't use whatever gimmicks are at our disposal to get people in the door. We shouldn't lure people in as, you know, by some contra-gospel means to teach them the gospel. I found, a, I found a $50 bill on the ground once. I picked it up, and it wasn't a real $50 bill. It was a fake, folded thing designed to look like a $50 bill on the outside. And on the inside, it said, Disappointed? You won't be if you let Jesus Christ become the Lord of your life. I'll tell you something. What does that do? That destroys credibility. It destroys credibility right there. That's kind of deceptive subterfuge. Nowhere in the Bible do you see the apostles tricking people into following Jesus. Or Jesus tricking people into following Him. No. That, that's not how it works. The message of the truth is supposed to be truthful by its very nature. It's not supposed to come from the father of lies. Jesus doesn't use the demons for publicity. He shuts them up. He doesn't want them telling people he's the son of God. You look at what Paul does, he puts a stop to it. The demonic discussion after many days of proclaiming that Jesus was the Lord of Paul and Silas... Paul commands the demon by that, the name of that same Lord Jesus, since you're calling Jesus Lord so much, then you need to obey the Lord Jesus and come out of her. The demon is forced to depart and the python-possessed woman is free from possession by python. Unfortunately, that doesn't make everybody happy. There are some people that were profiting off of her, if you'll remember, in verses 19 through 24. It says that, uh, and so we have the jailing of the converters in verses 19 through 24. When her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. And the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. This is how providence works. God, tell, God called them to come to Macedonia so they could be thrown in jail. You know, that's how the providence of God works sometimes. We have the jailing of the converters. And, you know, here's question to ask ourselves about that. Um, you know, this won't be the last time that Christianity's success damages pagan economics, by the way. We're going to have the same problem in chapter 19, whenever Demetrius the silversmith gets upset because Paul has apparently been so successful in preaching that he has actually hurt the sale of idols. That's a big deal. This won't be the first time Christianity damages pagan economics or uh, paganomics. The charge here, they're put on trial before the magistrates and they're charged with three things. First, they threw the city into confusion. Second, they're Jews because apparently that's a charge. Third, they are proclaiming unlawful customs for the Romans to observe. Starting a new religion was illegal in the Roman Empire. Of course, not all Romans pick up on the fact right away that Christianity and Judaism are distinct, so sometimes they're kind of meshed together. People thought Christianity was a sect or a split off from Judaism and it was okay. But what's going on? They're coming around and appealing to the city's collective patriotic spirit in verse 22. 
They are violating the Roman customs. They're taking away from the Romanness of our city. They're affecting our way of life. They're trying to sneak into our city and change our values and probably teach a different language to our children while they're at it and never hear that kind of rhetoric today anymore, do we? The magistrates tear their robes. They have Paul and Silas beaten and thrown into prison. And the jailer takes them and he puts them in the inner prison and he puts their feet in the stocks. There's no way out of this situation. Unless you've been reading the book of Acts all along and you know that every time somebody gets put in prison, they break out within the day because the Lord breaks the prison open somehow. And that's exactly what happens. And what follows is not the jailing of the converters, but rather the converting of the jailer. In verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened and when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. He took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. All right. So first question we have to ask ourselves, what do you think about the idea of going to jail? Not going to the jail, which implies that you're just visiting, but going to jail, which implies that you're being incarcerated. Are we afraid of that as Christians? You know, jail conditions in the ancient world were much more barbaric much more brutal, much more cruel than they were in the ancient world. You go to the jail today, you see people with their feet in stocks. No. You go to prison today, you don't get that. Paul and Silas didn't get, uh, get, didn't get television or meals or exercise time. They had their feet in stocks. They were immobilized. How would you respond to that? How would they respond to it? Well, they decided that was a good time to have a singing. I mean, prayer we can understand, but songs, songs are the sorts of things people do when they're joyful. James 5.13, is anyone joyful? Let him sing praises. And the prisoners all hear this. What might they have thought at this behavior? This is not the behavior of a prisoner. This is not the behavior of somebody that's just been flogged and locked up. Now their singing might have shooken up the prison, metaphorically speaking, but the earthquake shakes it up quite literally. Like the earthquake that broke open the tomb of Jesus. The doors are open, the chains come off. That's an oddly specific sounding earthquake, by the way. And of course, we know that's not a coincidence. The Lord is the one who busts open the prison, as he characteristically does in the Psalms. He breaks the bars of iron. He shatters them in pieces. The jailer, of course, realizes he's in trouble because the prison's open. He sees that the doors are open. Prisoners are probably escaping, and he's doomed because if you're a jailer in the Roman world and your prisoners escape, it's your life for theirs. Um, if you're reading along in our First Kings class, in First Kings 20, this is a similar issue comes up when keeping prisoners of war. Your life will go for his life, the prophet tells Ahab. Losing prisoners you were supposed to be guarding meant you lost your own life. And so his response is to try to take his own life. In verse 27, but Paul doesn't see suicide as a valid option. He reassures the jailer, none have fled, none have tried to take advantage of this situation, we're all here. So the jailer calls for lights and falls down in fear before Paul and Silas. The man responsible for fastening their feet in stocks is now falling down at those same feet. As Isaiah the prophet put it in Isaiah 60 and verse 14, the sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing down to you. And all those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And the jailer asks that great, big, eternal question, what must I do to be saved? Now the jailer's mind might be on his punishment, you know, or the fear of losing his life. But his question is bigger than that, and Paul knows it, and he answers the question as if it were bigger than that. The sum all answer is this, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your household. Now, is that the sum-all explanation for how a person is saved? 
you know, some people have latched on to that and say, see, Paul said it was just belief. Baptism's not necessary. Which, of course, doesn't make sense because, you know, believing in the Lord Jesus clearly entails baptism as is indicated by the rest of the passage in the chapter. They speak the word to the jailer and his household. The jailer cleans their wounds. He immediately gets baptized. Baptism, I, I just want to note something about that. You know, baptism wasn't something that could wait till the next morning. Oh, pff, well, I mean, surely it'll be light of day and we can uh, clean up a little bit after ourselves. No! The jailer doesn't wa wait. Oh, you know, I, I, I really want my family to be there, so I'm going to wait and invite them all around. When they get here, then I'll do it. No! That's not an option either. What about, uh, well, you know, we have to wait for the church's monthly baptism day. No! Same hour of the night. The need for baptism is seen as so urgent, they take care of it before they eat. Before they eat? Oh, well, I thought eating was kind of important, don't you? But no. No, this is more important. Being born again is more important than eating physical food. Is, let me, so let me ask you a question. Is baptism important? Is it really such a big deal? If not, why so much urgency? Why so much immediacy? You note the interchangeability in verses 31 through 34 of baptism and belief. The Bible never equates it with works. The Bible, no, there's not a single passage in the Bible that calls baptism a work, but there's quite a bit that associates it with faith. The two are so inextricably linked that one is never seen without the other. They cannot be separated. And true belief in God entails a belief in what He said. And that includes the demand for immersion in water for the forgiveness of sins. True baptism demands belief in God. It's not something you're unaware of or oblivious to. You'll note this. He was baptized, he and all his household. He had believed in God, he and all his household. You know the interchangeability of those phrases in verses 33 and 34. Pretty compelling evidence to me that they are linked together. And the result of their conversion, in verse 34, is joy, as we've come to see many, many times in the book of Acts. Well, of course, there's one more thing in Philippi that has to happen. We've, got to, we've still got that issue with the officials to deal with. And they're going to be humiliated. When the day came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen saying, Release those men! And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you, therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. Now are they sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and had appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. You know, I, you, you got to love how public officials are backpedaling on this. They try to release Paul the next day, as if nothing had happened. Nothing really took place here. Let him go. And Jailer released that message to Paul. You're to go in peace. And Paul says, oh no, we're not going to go in peace. We're not going quietly. He brings up the fact that he and Silas were beaten without trial and thrown in prison, even though they were Roman citizens. But it's interesting, he waits until this point to bring it up. It's hard to appreciate this in a culture where citizenship is so widespread that you are literally a citizen if you are born within the realm of the territory itself. And where non-citizens are, uh, are able to enjoy a lot of, but not all of, the same rights as uh, citizens, non-citizens and citizens. Now, in the Roman Empire though, it's different. Not everybody born within the borders of the Roman Empire is considered a citizen. Some people had to pay to be citizens. The people who were citizens had certain rules that you had to follow about how they were to be prosecuted, how they were to be punished. A Roman citizen, for instance, could not be crucified. That was against the law. They could also not be beaten without trial. And for that matter, they couldn't place chains on them without trial, which would have gotten the authorities into a heap of trouble. Well, the authorities are terrified at this revelation. Verse 38. They beg Paul and Silas to leave town. <laughs> Why are they... Well, We've got to get them out of here. Because they're so busy interested in saving their own necks. They're not interested in the well-being of Paul and Silas. But there's an implicit issue here too that might have been on Paul's mind and that would have certainly been helpful in that it would spell protection for the newly established Philippian congregation. 
God's congregations, God's churches are not allies with the state. They're not affiliated with the state. But there's nothing wrong with using the state's laws to your advantage to further the cause of the gospel and to protect yourself. That's what Paul does here. He protects himself and the congregation implicitly that he had started. There's something to that. And so uh, we need to keep that in mind. There's sometimes debate about that, you know, oh, you know, churches can't sign this agreement or they can't claim this exempt, tax-exempt status or they can't do this or they can't do that. And the truth is that, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves because there's precedent in the Bible for using the state's laws to protect the congregation. As long as we don't compromise on what the Bible actually teaches, of course. That goes without saying. And they went out of the house, they entered the house of Lydia, saw the brethren, they encouraged them, and they departed. And that's how the gospel got started at Philippi. Next time we'll look at some other places in Macedonia and uh, Achaia, Thessalonica and Berea and Athens. But for now I want to invite us to consider a question, which is basically, you know, where, where is our trust in the Lord? And if we're here, on the one hand, of course, there are some who they have... You know, they've never been immersed into Christ and they need to uh, make themselves right with the Lord and demonstrate their trust in the Lord in that way. Certainly that's how the Philippian jailer responded to the gospel. He believed all his household. He was baptized. Then there are also those who have been baptized who, well, they're living their life without trust in the Lord. You know, and so they've been immersed into water. Perhaps they meant it. Perhaps they didn't. I don't know. Only you know and the Lord knows. But there is... Uh, the, the element to that that we need to have is the trust in the Lord again. People get so upset and so afraid that, oh no, they're going to come and they're going to put us in jail. Well, Paul and Silas responded to that with singing and prayer. They were prepared for it. They were prepared to suffer. Now, I can't predict the future. I think it's generally a mistake to try to predict the future without revelation from the Spirit. But you know what I do know? I know that the Lord protects His people. He may not protect them from imprisonment. He may not protect them from having to die. But He protects His people because He has the power of life and death in His hand. Because He is Lord of the living and the dead. As Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, in verse 13, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for doing what is good? Well, you might think a lot of people, but really no one. Because the resurrection undoes the worst of damages that humanity can dish out to you. So the question I have to ask is, do you trust the Lord? Do you trust the Lord, who has the power over life and death, to save you and resurrect you in that last day? Are you willing to proclaim that gospel without fear? Are you willing to share it with others without the fear of embarrassment, or of awkwardness, or persecution, or of imprisonment, or even of death? That's a lesson I think we all have growing to do in. I know I do. But if you're here this morning and you have a specific way in which you feel you have not trusted the Lord as of late, and you want to make your life right with Him by demonstrating your trust in Him, whether it be to be baptized for the first time for forgiveness of sins, or whether it be to reaffirm your trust in Him so that we might encourage you and help you get to heaven, whatever that need may be, the answer is found at the cross of Jesus Christ. Come to Him now while together we stand and we sing.